I'm Wilbur Leatherberry, and this is the panel on the future of ADR. I'm a member of the case faculty. Uh, Professor Nickel used my favorite Yogi Berra line and the most appropriate Yogi Berra line about the difficulty of predictions, especially about the future. Uh, Yogi was once asked, what time is it? And he responded, you mean right now? <laughs> um, That's funny. Now is the time for the, uh, the fourth and final panel, the one you've been waiting for, to discuss alternative dispute resolution. And uh, we have three distinguished panelists. Uh, first, we have Professor Leela Love, who is a professor and the director of the Kukin Program for Conflict Resolution and Cardozo Mediation Clinic at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law at Yeshiva. She's an active mediator, and her scholarship has focused on that process. She's also the co-author of an excellent law school textbook on dispute resolution, a book that I've used in teaching our first year elective course on dispute resolution. Uh, Professor Spencer Ness uh, is a colleague uh, on the case faculty. Uh, we've been colleagues for the 35 years I've been here. Uh, he has had a strong interest in the legal process and in dispute resolution uh, more broadly since being exposed to the Hart and Sachs materials at Harvard Law School. Uh, he teaches the first year dispute resolution course uh, in the years that I don't, uh, and he's teaching at this term. He developed some materials on the uh, legal process and on the civil jury uh, that I've used when I've taught that course, along with uh, Professor Love's book. Uh, in the area of ADR, he's tended to focus on arbitration. And in the center uh, is William Leahy, uh, who's had a distinguished career as a litigator. He graduated from that other law school down I-71, the Ohio State University Law School, and began his practice here in Cleveland with Thompson, Hine, and Flory, where he developed a products liability and business litigation practice. A few years ago, he moved to Buckingham Doolittle, where he is now a shareholder. Uh, Bill got involved in ADR about the time I did, which is about 20 years ago, uh, around the time of the inception of the Court of Next ADR program in the Federal District Court here. Um, he, I think, was a member of the original panel of neutrals, uh, and uh, he's now stopped working as a litigator uh, and is concentrating on developing an ADR practice. Uh, he has experience both in mediation and arbitration as counsel for litigants, uh, and has had considerable experience as a mediator as well. In addition to practice, uh, Bill serves as an adjunct professor here at the law school teaching uh, courses in pretrial practice and alternative dispute resolution. Uh, we'll try to reserve some time for the panelists to interact and to take your questions and comments. Uh, please reserve questions and comments uh, until the, all the panelists have spoken. Let's begin with uh, Professor Love. Can you imagine the challenge of teaching mediation in a law school of young, bright, smart, alecky students and having the last name of Love, Professor Love, <laughs> teaching mediation. It's been, uh, it's been challenging. Uh, I'd, I would um, echo the thanks of previous panelists for this law school, the students who've organized this, my uh, erudite, fast-talking, enthusiastic other panelists who, who have uh, preceded this panel, but actually where, where I want to focus my thanks is on the audience, the participants here who have weathered a full day of, of panelists who are so committed to their topics, so passionate about their topics, but your attention has been really stimulated, and, and I thank you for that. And it reminds me. I have a daughter in law school right now. She's a 2L at Fordham. And um, 
I recently was uh, asking her about how law school was, and she's, she had had a hard semester, her first 2L semester, mainly because she just was kind of finding some of it boring. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I started asking my own students, you know, is it, are you interested? Do you like the courses? And um, the kids were saying, oh, yeah, you know, I really like corporations and ADR is wonderful. And so I, I was relating this to my, I got cheered up, you know, at our law school, everybody's really engaged. <laughs> so I told this to my uh, daughter and she said, mom, they're lying. <laughs> so, so just a, a note to all the professors here about the importance of uh, we get so focused and sort of committed and enthusiastic about our topic uh, that sometimes we, we kind of overdo it. So that has led me to want to back up a moment and talk a little bit about dispute resolution, the big picture, to try to get maybe the law students here and perhaps some of the lawyers aren't as enthusiastic as, as the panelists about dispute resolution. First of all, ADR, alternative dispute resolution. For those of you who know ADR um, by that acronym, meaning alternative dispute resolution, you are no longer politically correct. It does not mean alternative dispute resolution. ADR has is, is, uh, come to be, at this point in time, appropriate dispute resolution because most, most of us um, have come to believe that you know, the, the vast majority of disputes are resolved by negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and so on, these, these other alternatives to lit litigation. Recent, four years ago, the ICC in Paris inaugurated the um, international mediation competition. This is a big deal because mediation was not big in the EU. And in, in the EU, in Paris, ADR means amicable dispute resolution. Arbitration isn't even in that fold, interestingly, because it's an adjudicative adversarial process. But uh, last point in this sort of overview is the following. Just to get, for those of you who aren't used to thinking about the differences in mediation and arbitration and litigation, here's a light bulb riddle for the end of the day. How many judges does it take to change a light bulb? Any, any takers? Three. Three. Why? And one, okay, well, well, let me, let me pose an alternative. Uh, one possible answer in addition to your three would be none. Judges don't change light bulbs. They tell you who's responsible for the darkness. <laughs> How many arbitrators does it take to change a light bulb? Well, None again would be the, the answer. Um, they too will tell you who's responsible for the darkness. And like judges, they'll assess damages accordingly. Uh, the difference being you can't appeal what they say. So we get to mediators. How many mediators does it take to change a light bulb? Any volunteers? Well, none, none. That's right, none again. <laughs> Um, they, they inspire light bulbs to change themselves. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, it could end there with ADR, but let's take it one further. How many lawyers does it take to change a light bulb? How, none. Uh, but actually, there, there's a different answer this time. How many can you afford? <laughs> okay. Um, the topic of of the paper that I would like to write has to do with mandatory mediation in the courts. We've been hearing all day about the courts and not a word about um, ADR so far, I think. 
You might be interested to know that 70 percent of the Federal Circuit Courts have mandatory mediation programs. 100 percent have uh, mediation programs that are voluntary or mandatory. In an online report of the National Center of State Courts, 44 states report um, having mandatory mediation uh, programs in court-connected cases. So what's happening in courts is, uh, is pretty phenomenal in terms of dispute resolution. Now that's not a typo. <laughs> it reads, what does a court house? What's in a court? What is sustained by a court? And it's a philosophical question that goes well beyond this talk. Many people uh, believe that a court is a place where litigations are, are held, that the role of the judge is to manage litigation. Owen Fiss, probably the most eloquent spokesperson for the view that the you know, that the settlement against settlements, that the courts and judges should do their primary function of, of judging and litigation. But if you look at what's happening in courts, it's not one door to litigation, but the view that Frank Sanders suggested in 1976 that a court, that, that picture, you can see one door in the court. Well, Frank Sanders talked about courts with multi-doors. So you would go in the court and then there would be an array of doors and you would have your dispute and you would be sent to the most optimal process for your particular dispute. And if you look at the extreme, so from one door to multi-door, um, now in New York, for example, and we have a wonderful court in Brooklyn, that, that is run by Judge Alex Calabresi, a problem-solving court. And under that, the roof of that courthouse is mediation, arbitration, youth court, social workers, a housing clinic that helps people get housings, all, all sorts of um, different services and so on. That's sort of the extreme. Um, so one of the questions is, what does a court house, what should it house, what sort of justice should we be dispensing? Now, as a speaker, and you probably should ask this of every speaker, um, I'm going to sort of make some pitches. And I, I want to disclose that I, I'm a mediator and a lucky one, and I say, lucky because I have had such phenomenal experiences as a mediator in terms of seeing radical shifts, people coming in adversarial, antagonistic with complicated problems and going away with really remarkable solutions. And um, so many of us are, are prisoners of confirmation bias, you know, we, we see things a certain way and we we tend to get results because we see them a certain way. Um, so maybe I'm lucky or maybe mediation is as good as I think it is. That, that's the question I'd leave for you. I'm an ADR advocate. I'm the chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution. By the way, 20,000 plus strong, if you want to know how sort of energetic the ADR movement is. Uh, these days, and I suspect I'm conflict adverse, so I get more enthusiastic than the rest of the lawyers in the room when things get resolved in a kind of friendly way. So um, what is mediation? If you didn't learn from the light bulb riddle, it's uh, negotiation assisted by a third party, a neutral third party. Um, in fact, the word mediation has come to stand for a real array of processes from the neutral beating people up, trashing and bashing their case, to a process that I would frankly advocate more where the neutral assists the parties in understanding one another better, developing sort of a problem-solving approach, and then coming to agreements that are optimal given the party's interests. So that's mediation. What's 
mandatory mediation. Um, mandatory mediation is when the courts or the legislature requires parties to engage in mediation pretrial. And you see there a picture of Franz Kafka, the trial, and interesting that Kafka has been mentioned earlier. <laughs> One of the problems with mandatory mediation is can you imagine you go to all the trouble and expense to get into court and suddenly somebody tells you, oh no, you know, there, there's another step, there's another whole process that you don't even understand that you have to go through before you get into court. And that's one of the issues with mandatory mediation, that it's, it's an add-on to getting to litigation in the first place. I want to, I'm not going to talk about all these, but I'm going to just throw them up and, and talk about one or two. Um, the benefits of mandatory mediation to some extent are similar to the benefits of mediation generally. Um, but there are a few ones on that list that you wouldn't see if it was just mediation rather than mandatory mediation. For example, one of the difficulties of getting parties to mediation is that nobody wants to admit weakness. So that if you're required to go, it takes away that hurdle. Um, nobody has to, to be the supplicant asking the other party to come to, to uh, mediation. The third point down where it says no substantial harm Constitutional law scholars worry a lot about interference with the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial, uh, and we want to make sure that mediation doesn't do that or any other ADR process we require of people so that one might argue, and you might disagree, that a requirement to go to a mediator, listen to their opening statement, make one of your own, try a little bit, maybe two hours, maybe three hours, given the cost of litigation isn't too bad, isn't too much. But we're going to explore that a little more in a moment. Maybe you'll think, wow, that's a lot to ask of people. But compare it to the cost of a day in trial, and in a moment I'm going to talk about the, the upside. Uh, the fourth point down where I say it works, that's not one of those hated conclusory statements that your law professors tell you not to make. Um, the evidence that it works is numerous studies of mandatory mediation which show that the results of mandatory mediation are quite similar to voluntary mediation. That is, the same rates of settlement mandatory, voluntary, the same rates of satisfaction with the process, mandatory, voluntary. So given that information, it sort of, I think, is, uh, tends to make you think, huh, this, is, this might be a good idea. I'm just going to pause for a moment where, while you read the rest of the list, but my time doesn't allow me to and that's not the whole list, by the way. People argue that it educates parties about ways to resolve disputes other than adversarial uh, methods of dispute resolution. There's a longer, it, it tries to shift our adversarial culture, for example, would be another benefit. Now downsides. If a case gets settled, no legal precedent is created. Um, there's a possibility of no agreement, and now you've wasted your time in mediation. Now, a mediator would argue, oh, you didn't waste your time. You understand the other side better. You understand you've narrowed the issues, perhaps. Uh, the case might settle uh, sometime shortly after the mediation. Um, and the other major downside that I, I think everyone would agree, it does interfere with people's right to directly go to trial, directly go um, to the court. 
And some people argue that uh, the message, our public message, the rule of law message, you know, that, that we believe in a rule of law and that due process concerns maybe don't seem as important if you're shoved into a mediation process. Now, I wanted to, just to keep your attention here, give you a little quiz. Which of these two case types do you think would be more suitable for um, mandatory mediation? Because one of the questions that scholars think about is, well, should we track cases and send certain types of cases to mediation and others not? So let's look at what's probably an easier call, the family matters. Probate courts where families are fighting over assets, and as I look at this one, I recall a case between two brothers who were fighting over an art collection that had been left to them by their very famous father, a uh, very valuable collection, and there were complicated issues because different family, different uh, ones of the siblings had taken things out of the connection prior to the father's death, sold them, pocketed the money. Um, after the father's death, people had different uh, siblings had taken artwork and uh, sold it, and it, so there was an effort to get the art back and divide it up and so on that the probate court kind of gave up and threw it to mediation. Um, so would you want there to be a mandatory mediation program for probate court cases? Raise your hand if you think that's a good idea. Does anybody not think it's a good idea? Mandatory. Mandatory. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, so there are two people here. They, why don't they stand up? So, you know, so uh, most pe many people think that in situations where there's a continuing relationship to the parties that's important to society, we should foster methods that help those parties get along because there's going to be societal costs to continuing enmity. Um, divorce cases might be another example of that. In this particular case, because it was mediated, those brothers found a way to time the sale of the art collection. They probably realized upwards of a million dollars being able to collaborate together in the sale of that artwork. So if you measure the benefit economically, um, it, it was very large and relationally it was important as well because uh, the brothers talked about everything from the way they communicated via email versus telephone. There's a whole host of disputes. Um, but let me get to the three minutes. This other case. Most lawyers would say if there's a constitutional issue, it should not uh, go on a mandatory mediation track. In fact, it should be taken out of a mandatory mediation track. And I, I'd just like to make a pitch here before I flip to my last slide that the states that have sent all civil cases to mediation might be the best approach. The, the paper I'm working on will offer some model for how uh, statutes might structure a mandatory mediation program. But very briefly, the, the map there um, focuses on the city of Glen Cove. This is one case I've been co given permission by the parties to speak about, uh, and I've written a little about it. Um, in that case, the, it, the legal issue had to do with the constitutionality of an ordinance that prevented pedestrians from talking to people in motor vehicles at a shaping point. That's where day laborers meet, meet uh, potential employers. And it, it did get sent to mediation. And the many civil rights lawyers who knew about this case who were involved in it objected to that along the lines that Owen Fiss, those of you who know Owen Fiss, would object. I just want to say that many, many social precedents were set by that case because it went to mediation. I had the privilege of being the mediator 
what the police, for example, negotiated with advocates of the minority group, the Salvadorans, to develop protocols for how police would interact with people who didn't speak English. Um, there were agreements about use of the city soccer field. There were agreements about how the town would post signs so that non-English speaking people could interact more easily with the town. There was agreements about how the Salvadorans would conduct themselves to make themselves more uh, successful citizens of the town. There were all sorts of social precedents that ultimately other towns looked at Glen Cove to emulate. So that the lawyer's exclusive focus, I think, on legal precedents, while it's wonderful, um, there are other reasons for our uh, using disputes to improve society to help people collaborate with one another. I'm mindful of the time, so I'm just going to flip. So I would say both of these types of cases might benefit from mediation, even though the lawyers involved don't necessarily know that unless they've studied mediation. This slide, these are critics of mediation, Owen Fiss against settlement, Trina Grillo, who talked about process dangers for women who tend to want to be collaborative anyway. So when they finally get to court and finally bolster themselves up to fight, they're pulled back into mediation and told to be collaborative. That's very confusing, says Trina Grillo, and I think it's a good point. Jim Coben, who writes about mediation's dirty little secret, that is that mediators try to manipulate people, according to Jim Coben, to, to settle. Um, and final slide is just some preliminary recommendations. This is the conclusion is not written yet, but that mediation should be early as long as the mediator explores with the party's uh, necessary information exchange. There should be no significant delay to trial. Uh, the parties themselves, not just the lawyer, should be pres <coughs> present. Um, there should be an opt-out of mediation. I believe one party should be able to require mediation. One party, after all, requires litigation and all its expenses. No coercion on the part of the mediator and quality control of neutrals. That's it. I don't know if you want to keep that. <laughs> I'll take it as an inspiration. <laughs> uh, I, I do some arbitration for the American Arbitration Association, and I, I've never done mediation, although I have been involved to some extent of trying to teach what mediation is. And, uh, and in my course in dispute resolution, I certainly have uh, gotten in, into mediation. Uh, but I've never mediated anything except perhaps uh, trying to between my three sons, and then I have not had much success. So they, they've learned they've learned to, to live together or live apart uh, on their own, which is a, which is another solution to dispute resolution. Just, uh, <laughs> walk away. Yes. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about arbitration, it's particularly about the uh, decision in the the only decision of significance in the in the Roberts era on um, the. Um, on arbitration, um, uh, in, uh, and I'll try to talk fast. I won't uh, have a whole lot to say. In, in 1925, the American Arbitration Act was Federal Arbitration Act was was adopted, and um, and it seemed clear at the time for all that uh, who studied it and were involved with it that it was primarily uh, to uh, deal with business to business uh, disputes. Um, and the reason for the need for it is because the courts, both the courts and state courts and federal courts, as well as even the English courts, were very hostile to arbitration, would not enforce arbitration agreements, would not enforce arbitration awards, uh, particularly uh, pre-dispute resolution, uh, pre-dispute uh, arbitration uh, agreements. Those are agreements entered into by parties who don't then have a dispute. dispute. Um, um, not that there were, weren't exceptions and then not that there weren't some qualifications to that statement, but it was true. So there was a need for it, and of course then there was state arbitration statutes adopted uh, about the same time. That's in, that's in the 20s. Um, in the 1953, the Supreme Court decided Wilco versus Swan, uh, which held that, um, that if someone who was suing in a, 
uh, for securities fraud under the SEC Acts, uh, uh, had signed an arbitration agreement, they could, con could proceed with their uh, litigation. They did not have to go to arbitration, even though they had agreed to, because the statute and the interpretation said that uh, you can't waive your rights uh, uh, under the statute, uh, under the SEC statute. Um, and, uh, and that meant that a very large category of disputes uh, were kept out of arbitration. Um, and it's not just the, it, even though that case was limited to the SEC, um, most people uh, believed at the time, I believe, and I wasn't around, I was a little before my time, that, um, uh, that, that arbitration um, uh, by agreement was not going to be enforceable um, in any kind of statutory rights case. Um, and um, in 64, 1964, I graduated from law school. I woke over Swan, the only case I had heard of, the only thing I knew about arbitration. Uh, in 67, 1967, was the uh, conference uh, that was held uh, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of Roscoe Pound's uh, lecture to the American Bar Association. Pound's uh, address was called The Causes of Popular Dissatisfaction with the Administration of Justice. And um, and it was Frank Sanders and the group at Harvard who got together at uh, this conference to sort of look back and see why is uh, why are, are so much uh, unhappiness with our legal system today and our court system and dispute resolution system. And that's where Frank came out with this uh, this um, uh, plan for a uh, courtroom with many doors. Um, and uh, the keynote speaker of that conference, incidentally, was um, Warren Berger, who was at that time the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, in that same year, 1967, um, uh, the uh, case of uh, Prima Paint Corporation versus Flood and Conklin came out. Uh, and Prima Paint uh, held um, that um, uh, Prima case Paint involved a, a, a business dispute in which one party claimed that the other had, had uh, defrauded it. Um, and therefore, because of the defrauding, uh, defrauded entering the contract, uh, fraud in the inducement, the whole contract was voidable. If the contract was voidable, the arbitration clause was voidable, and it didn't have to go to arbitration. Perfectly sensible uh, interpreta uh, interpretation of, of the law of contracts. And the Supreme Court says, oh, no, um, the arbitrator can decide the, 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 the fraud case. And gradually, a number of cases uh, 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 articulated that more clearly. So you, if you are going to have a, a challenge in arbitration, you've got to challenge the arbitration clause itself, not the contract. Um, and uh, there may be some exceptions to that, but uh, I, there's been none in the Supreme Court uh, or any other court that I know of. Um, so that now we had just an explosion. And then, of course, a, a few just not much later, I've got to hear, in, in 1989, which is uh, 20 years later, but uh, uh, Wilco versus Swan, the securities case, was overruled. But before that, there had been a number of cases which held that uh, you can arbitrate statutory causes of action. Um, now, uh, 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 practically, uh, well, say a very large percentage of employment discrimination cases and employment cases generally are uh, are resolved by arbitration. Closer, away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, <clears throat> arbitration is a is a major way of resolving employment disputes. Um, m m perhaps the most important one. I don't know the statistics on that because one of the things about arbitration is it's private, so you don't have statistics. Uh, we we have some, but they're not uh, uh, comprehensive by any means. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, so we have statutory cause of action, not just in uh, not just in securities, which is another big. You virt virtually you cannot. Uh, open a securities account uh, without an arbitration clause in it, uh, and that's by virtue of the uh, complex uh, system of, of regulation, but basically the Securities Exchange Commission uh, requires it now. Uh, and there are some other areas where, where basically this so-called uh, uh, consensual arbitration by contract is actually required by some kind of a regulatory authority. Um, this past summer, uh, uh, there was a publication of a study by Professors Eisenberg, Miller, and Sherwin uh, about the use of arbitration in business and consumer uh, and employment. Um, the uh, employment and consumer arbitration, in, you know, what they did is look at contracts, the actual contracts. Um, and the business contracts they looked at, about 10% or less than 10% actually had an arbitration clause in it. So businesses, and that's 
a smaller number than it appeared used to be, or what most people understood it to be earlier. So the use of arbitration among business to business um, is declining. Uh, the arbitration among business to consumer or business to employee is booming uh, to a point where it's over 75 percent. And in, if you open a bank account, you sign an arbitration clause. If you bought a computer, you, you have an arbitration clause. Um, uh, now, there are other areas for, where it's not so uh, universal, but it's so universal that we have a huge category of, of disputes that are resolved outside of courts. And this is by virtue of the fact that the Supreme Court has uh, not only uh, made it possible, but but almost made it inevitable that this that this happened by making it, it uh, uh, totally enforceable and, and very difficult to challenge. Um, it is not the result of the Roberts Court. It goes back to uh, to the Burger Court and uh, and all the courts in between have con been consistently enforcing. Uh, there is an opinion by uh, Justice. Um, O'Connor, a dissenting opinion, and one by Thomas another, in another case, both pointing out that this is, is, is really a, a, a misreading of the history and misreading of the statute, uh, but it's much too late to complain about that now. Uh, that means that the Supreme Court has made it possible, almost inevitable, that a, a huge, uh, a, a huge categories of, of disputes that uh, ordinary people have uh, will never reach the courts. Uh, and this has all the consequences uh, that uh, have been pointed out by others that, for one thing, we don't have precedent developed because the cases never get uh, to the courts. Um, and uh, we have privacy so that people who have disputes uh, get their dispute resolved, but nobody knows about it. Uh, now, it's also true that that uh, most cases that go to court actually are resolved by, uh, by settlement. Uh, and those are usually uh, confidential as well. So it's not merely a choice between <coughs> litigation in court with a <coughs> jury trial and, uh, and, uh, and arbitration, because settlement is the, the, what actually happens in both categories, though the percentage of cases that get resolved in, uh, by settlement that are uh, that started as an arbitration case is much smaller than that in, in litigation. For, there may be some uh, good reasons for that. Um, now, why I always ask my classes, why do the litigants um, fight so hard to avoid uh, to avoid arbitration? Why does someone in, uh, who's employed by Circuit City go to the United States Supreme Court and say, <clears throat> I want my dispute to go to court. I don't want to go to arbitration. What's at stake here? Uh, is arbitration all that bad? And that's the, the question which um, I, I, I don't have a really good answer to that. I, do, I have some answers to that. Um, and, um, well, one is that there's a lot of mistrust of arbitration and the whole process, uh, the institutions of arbitration. Some of this certainly is justified. The National Arbitration Forum is a for-profit company that provides arbitrators for uh, a lot of... Uh, of the the common one, well, you probably your bank account is uh, has a national arbitration forum as the as, as the preferred uh, uh, institution to resolve your disputes. They market, uh, they do market their their services, and they market it on the basis uh, they don't say this uh, uh, publicly, but they market it privately as a basis that they provide a business friendly arbitration uh, panels. Um, um, so, uh, and, and, and there's a, some really, a story of a professor at Harvard uh, 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 who, was, uh, who was on their panels and who was, when she decided against the, the business one time and actually found the business liable for substantial sums of money, uh, she was taken, all her cases were taken away from her and she was basically a pariah in the, in, before the National Arbitration Forum. Um, so there's, that's one of the reasons for the distrust. Um, uh, and that's certainly... Uh, uh, now I do the the American Arbitration Association um, has a better record uh, and um, and they don't uh, I mean they don't they don't get it's a nonprofit organization but of course the thing is a nonprofit organization does have has have um, uh, officers and directors who are uh, who who get paid or officers not the directors um, well there's another concern that when you go to arbitration you lose your right to as a practical matter to punitive damages and statutory damages, or you'll, you'll not get as, uh, what you would be entitled to in the law. Um, there's some evidence that this is uh, maybe so, but there's quite a bit of evidence that it, that it, it may not be so. Um, 
loss of class actions. Um, uh, everybody thought, and I mean, I think everybody thought that you couldn't have a class action in arbitration. That's bizarre. Um, but uh, the Green Tree case, set, the Supreme Court said, well, why not? Um, why not you have a class action? And, and they said, that, of course, uh, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, uh, it depends on what the agreement is. Uh, we'll enforce the agreement. And it has, and then uh, the trouble is that, uh, that um, well, as soon as that case came down, the American Arbitration Association rushed out some rules for class action arbitrations. And then all the, all the employees, or employers, and all the businesses uh, amended their arbitration clauses to say that there'll be no class actions. Uh, in arbitration. Um, um, so as a practical matter, we don't have uh, a class actions in arbitration. Now those provisions have been held to be unconscionable uh, by some courts where it's a matter of aggregation of small claims which couldn't conceivably go to court on their own, but which uh, put together in a class action uh, would <coughs> provide some uh, remedies. Um, but not all courts have done that. Um, the, uh, the cost of the fees is another thing, which also some courts have held that if they charge too much, then you're deprived of due process. There's a, there are situations uh, that are reported. Uh, you buy a computer for $800, and, uh, and in order to get your, when it doesn't work and they won't fix it or they can't fix it and they won't give you a new machine or your money back, you go to court. Uh, I mean, say you, uh, uh, you, you, you can go to arbitration, but it's going to cost you uh, $700 to go to arbitration, or maybe $1,200. So you basically deprived altogether of your rights. Uh, and that's, of course, is one of the problems. Um, so there are limitations, however. One of the limitations is what exactly is arbitration? And um, there are some cases, uh, interesting cases on that, where things are essentially uh, uh, not final uh, uh, and are appealable. And that takes me to the Hall Street case. Uh, Hall Street is the case that uh, Roberts was on the court, although he was in, the, and he concurred with the majority opinion uh, by Souter, but he didn't, uh, he didn't write it. Um, and it's a complicated fact pattern in terms of the procedure, uh, but it basically you had a, 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 a dispute uh, in which the arbitration agreement provided that, uh, that any arbitrator's award would be subject to appeal on questions of, of law. And that appeal uh, right uh, was by contract. And the Supreme Court of the United States says you can't do that. American Arbitra or Fair Arbitration Act uh, Section 10 has tells you what you can do to appeal uh, a, a, or to challenge or, or, or to uh, seek to vacate an arbitration award, and uh, appeal of law is not on there, that list. And that list is exclusive, therefore the courts have no jurisdiction. Um, I read it as a jurisdictional thing, because there's some language in the op majority opinion uh, uh, that su suggests that there could be some remedy. Uh, in other words, you could have sorry, sorry, an appeal uh, in a state court, maybe. Um, and uh, there is one case uh, in California, Cable Connection versus DirecTV, in <coughs> which uh, there is a, a, a clause in a contract saying that in the, the arbitration award can be appealed uh, to any court with a the jurisdiction. They appeal to the state court, and the, um, the state court says, sure, uh, we'll hear your case, and um, that we're not compelled to, uh, to uh, dismiss it by Hall Street because Hall Street is talking about federal courts, not state courts. Furthermore, the provision in the, um, and I'm not sure this is in Hall Street or the other case that, that it w preceded Hall Street, the provision said that, um, let me see, I got, I got the, one of the grounds for, for, um, for vacating an arbitration award is as if the arbitrators has exceeded their authority. The uh, Supreme Court in Hall Street says that doesn't mean that they manifestly disregard the law. Uh, it means they exceeded their authority. Uh, well, in the California, what the contracts are being uh, say, they say the arbitrators do not have power to, uh, to, uh, to, to make erroneous ruling of, of law. So it's outside their power, therefore it's appealable. Um, well, that case is going to be, it's 114 citations to date. The case is less than a year old. And, and that case is going to be, uh, a, a, for, for better or for worse, a very significant case and a uh, part of the record of the Roberts Court. Thank you.
Thank you to the uh, Case Western Reserve Law School and Case Western Reserve Law Review for the privilege of appearing today uh, with uh, three distinguished professors, my friend Bill Leatherberry, uh, Leela Love, and Spencer Neth. I'm a fanatical baseball fan, so I can't pass on the Yogi Berra thing. Uh, and I think it's germane to alternative dispute resolution, if I may say so. My favorite one is, there, if there's a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> and and Leela, with apologies to you, with the light bulb jokes, uh, one that may seem less germane to ADR, but I think is, if you think about it, and that is, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Can I give you another? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why do you ask? <laughs> Very good. I think that's better than mine. Um, I think I'm the only person today uh, who makes his living or has made his living full time as a litigator. So that gives me the daunting task of being sort of the uh, litigator in residence to try to give you my thoughts on the future of ADR. And if there's anything I'm sure all of you know about litigators, it's that we do not like to make predictions. Do not like to make predictions. I can't stand it when clients ask me to predict the outcome of a trial. I, I really don't like to do that. But let me give it a try, and uh, I'll give you my thoughts. <laughs> Either that or we can just ban right now, I guess. Um, first thing, which is kind of a self-evident proposition, and I don't know if it's been said before today or not, but there will always be a place for litigation. I, I really believe that. Now, you're thinking, well, he's just saying that because he makes his living as a litigator. And I have to tell you, I am not a great proponent of litigation. My clients will even tell you that I... I argue against it all the time, but the fact is that there are some disputes that must be litigated, and hopefully in the 21st century, those disputes will continue to be uh, adjudicated by juries and judges and not computers. I'm really rooting for that, I can tell you. Um, secondly, I think you're going to find uh, more lawyers wanting to be ADR specialists, and by that I mean becoming mediators or perhaps uh, becoming people who do nothing but ADR as advocates. I think you're going to see more and more of that. Yes, I think our unfortunate economy is going to drive a bunch of lawyers towards being mediators, but I think that will continue to be a trend uh, in the future. I, and I think another thing you will see is that law firms like mine uh, will create ADR groups within their firm. You know, we all have trial departments or litigation departments. I think we're going to have ADR departments. I started one at Thompson Hine 12 years ago. I'm starting one at Buckingham now. And I think that you're going to see more and more of that, a great proliferation of it. Um, I think you're going to find a lot of concentration on why do disputes, claims, and lawsuits occur. Preventative dispute resolution. Uh, if I have time, I'm going to write a book about why lawsuits get filed having nothing to do with the facts in the law, nothing to do with the facts in the law, how somebody was treated at a store or something of that nature. And I think you're going to see a lot more attention towards cutting these disputes off at the past before they occur. There's going to be a lot of writing on it. There's going to be a lot of talking about it. And I assure you the clients will drive that. I think ADR will be used earlier in the future. And by that, I mean, in many instances, before litigation occurs. Uh, you see that now. I think you're going to see it even more. Again, this is client-driven. We haven't talked about the clients, but they want earlier, efficient, reasonable solutions. That's what they want. Um, I think you're going to see less use of arbitration and more of mediation. I did not attend the whole program. But I'm sure there's been some talk about what is perceived to be the ills of arbitration, and they are many. Uh, I started as an advocate representing clients in arbitration in the 70s, and it was a completely different landscape. File your demand for arbitration, very little if any discovery, short time to resolution, great idea. That idea, unfortunately, has become, it's not too strong to say perverted. It really has. And unfortunately, it's the lawyers who have done that. Um, 
corporate America, if anybody cares what corporate America thinks, but a lot of them are my clients, some of them aren't, but corporate America wants mediation. They really do. They want mediation. And in many cases, they do not want arbitration. Um, Leela Love was a speaker at the CPR Institute annual meeting this year. At the, at the meeting last year, uh, there was an address given by the General Counsel of General Electric, which is the largest corporation in the world. And he said, we don't use arbitration anymore unless it's forced upon us by our customers. We don't use it. And he gave about six reasons why. And I could give him six more. In fact, I did. I sent him an email and said, here's six more reasons why you shouldn't use arbitration. Uh, Court-ordered mediation, which has been discussed by Leela, you know, is already a huge part, a total part of the fabric in places like California, Texas, Florida. We all know it's not that much of a part of the fabric in Ohio. I know Bill Leatherberry can attest to that. But I think it will become more and more an integral part of the fabric of our dispute resolution process in other states besides the most notable ones that I just named. I think you will see more video conference mediation. I've conducted a video conference mediation. Why? Because a plaintiff's lawyer in a personal injury case came to me and said, uh, you know what, She's, she lives in New Orleans. We don't want a spring to have her come up here. How about doing it by video conference? That's what we did. It worked out very, very well. Now, interestingly, years ago, if you went to one of these meetings, you would hear lawyers say, Videotape depositions are the wave of the future. Videotape trials are the wave of the future. Guess what? It didn't happen. Didn't happen. There was only one judge in Ohio that consistently conducted videotape trials, and that was Judge McChrystal over in Erie County. Everybody knows who Judge McChrystal is. Nobody else did it. As far as video depositions, very much the exception rather than the rule even today. But I think video conference mediation will happen. Um, I am concerned about the future of mediation because I am afraid that lawyers will mess up mediation like they messed up arbitration. I'm very worried about that. And I see the, I see the uh, tentacles reaching in already. Uh, mediation is a pretty good process. I'm tempted to say it's not broken, so why fix it? Uh, but I see some tendencies that that may happen. Um, I'm not a fan of the Uniform Mediation Act. Why? Because it addresses two things. Number one, confidentiality. Lawyers know all about confidentiality. They don't breach it. They don't need anybody to tell them to keep things confidential in mediation. And the other is qualifications of mediators. And the fact is, mediators who don't do very well don't get hired, and mediators who do well do get hired. That, that's how the marketplace uh, governs the qualifications of mediators. Um, the one area where I think there may be a need for guidance is in the area of ethics. And I, I've had the, the dubious distinction of being uh, ethics conflicts chair at Thompson Hine for over 10 years and at my present firm for five years. And I, I do think that there is a need for some guidance for mediators in the area of ethics. Not because I think mediators are unethical, because I'm not saying that at all. But there are just too many open questions out there about how mediators conduct their business. Uh, Leela was part of a panel at CPR Institute annual meeting which discussed ethics of mediators. And they took a straw vote and they said, how many of you think mediators should be able to uh, get their clients to sign an advance waiver of liability? About half the room said yes, about half the room said no. I was one of the people that said no. I'll be glad to share my reasoning after the meeting if you like. The people who said yes said, attorney mediators are not practicing law. They are not practicing law. So why should they be governed by these rules that govern lawyers? We all know that lawyers cannot ask clients to enter into an advance wa waiver of liability for legal malpractice. I submit that mediators shouldn't be able to do it either. So I think there's a need for some guidance there. There I would favor uh, some codification. Now here's a real controversial one on the heels of, of Professor Ness' remarks. I think there's going to be more judicial oversight of arbitration. I know that's not the trend. You know, I'm standing there. The, the, the tide is going to engulf me. But I really think there will be. And I think the reason is because America is very disturbed about arbitration, not just whether you can enforce an arbitration clause, but how it works, some of the results that occur that are, are completely off the wall. 
And I think people are going to start to step in and put pressure on the courts to say, we need to, to take more oversight here. I'm not saying that's a good or bad idea. I'm just saying I think it's going to happen. And we're already starting to see articles about it. Um, I was the judge for the CPR Institute Awards this year, and one of the articles was arguing that, uh, that there should be more judicial oversight of arbitration because of some of the uh, outrageous results or, or not very rational results that arbitrators uh, uh, get. And I've been pretty successful in arbitration, but I still think it's very much in need of attention. Um, now, how might we get arbitration to uh, conform to its earlier promise in the 70s? And I think there are a couple of answers. I don't know if they're adequate or not. One is streamline arbitration procedures. Uh, just institutionalize the notion that you can't do all these things that delay proceedings. You can't do all these things that drag things out over a, over a year. Um, all of those things. Clauses, contract clauses. You want to get to arbitration fast, put a clause in there that says you've got to get to hearing within 90 days. I don't see any reason why you can't do that. I think you're going to see more parties do it. Uh, we haven't even talked about it. I'm just going to ask that put it in the form of a question. I'm not going to talk about it because I know we have limited time. The, the most uh, widely used form of ADR is negotiation. And I think it'd be really fascinating to sit down and say, how are negotiations going to change? Is it going to be the good old standard of uh, me calling up Spencer Neft and saying, Spencer, uh, how about settling this case? You know, let's have a phone conversation about it. Or is there going to be something new that's going to happen? I think you're going to see more creative ADR clauses. You know, the, the old, you go to arbitration in front of the American Arbitration Association, you're going to see less of that, and you're going to see mo more multi-tiered our uh, ADR clauses. First negotiate, then mediate, then maybe arbitrate, maybe, or maybe arbitrate or litigate. I think you're going to see a lot more creativity in that area. Um, I think we need to search for new modes of alternative dispute resolution or appropriate dispute resolution, Leila. Um, we're very much focused on arbitration and facilitated mediation. I think we need to uh, have some uh, alternatives. Um, online, online dispute resolution is huge now, and it's going to get even bigger. Uh, PayPal and eBay resolved uh, 40 million disputes last year. Um, securities is one of the big areas for this. There are other areas as well. Geography will become less relevant in this world. Um, technology will allow people who never would have pressed disputes before to press their disputes. People would have said, ah, well, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother. Well, now maybe they'll bother if they can do it online. So you're going to see a lot more disputes being resolved in that way. That's going to have a huge impact on the expectation of privacy, on the expectation of confidentiality. And it's been posited that, in fact, people are actually more frank online than they would be in person. I don't know if that's true or not. You can arrive at your own conclusions on that, but that's what some people say. And then the final thing that I would like to say and uh, it's, it's a point I made at the CPR meeting just as an attendee. I was not a speaker. And that is, you know, a, a lot of time when we talk about ADRs and trials, we talk about the law firm bottom line. What we ought to be talking about as lawyers, and I would submit as law professors too, is what is good for the clients, what's in the best interest of the clients, whether it's someone who is, you know, the little guy who has a, com a consumer complaint or it's a, a big corporation. If we ask that question, I think we as lawyers, and I would submit as law professors, will do okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have t a couple of minutes for questions. Where are the microphones? We got somebody with mics? Um, right. Start with him and then down here. Right here. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to just sort of follow up on Professor Neth's um, presentation because the, 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 the topic of the day is access to courts in the Roberts era. And, and the, the courts push, and I think it really starts really at the Rehnquist Court, not really in the, in the Burger Court, for mandatory arbitration I think is going to accelerate, if anything, during the next few years. Uh, in the last 10 years, you've seen the court rule that Antitrust, Disability Act, Age Act, Title VII claims, TILA, Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, 
Fair Labor Standards Act case claims all can be subject to mandatory arbitration. Um, 13 or 14 cases in the last 10 years. Yeah, and and, and this term, uh, for the first time, the court is likely, I think, to rule uh, not simply that an employee or, or a consumer can involuntarily enter into an, uh, into an arbitration agreement, a mandatory arbitration agreement, but that a, a, an agent can waive the statutory right to go to court in the Penn Plaza case, where the question really is whether a labor union can, can by entering into a collective bargaining agreement, waive the employee's statutory right. Uh, and, and to me, this is the next step towards the complete abnegation of statutory rights for, uh, for individuals to go to court to pursue statutory claims. Now, let's just review the bidding in terms of the things that, that people forfeit when they go into mandatory arbitration. Punitive damages, often statutory damages, jury trial rights, discovery rights, um, appellate rights, uh, and, and, and those are just a, a few that come to mind. So if the question really is what's happening to access uh, to, to the courts in the, Roberts, uh, in the Roberts era, you need to first, I think, talk about the Buckeye case. Uh, Buckeye extends Prima Paint uh, considerably. In Buckeye, the question was whether a payday lending uh, contract that plainly was usurious under Florida law, that's the way the case came to the court, could, be in, could, the, could the arbitration agreement be enforced? The court extended prima paint to say even, even a contract that on its face violated state law was nonetheless subject to arbitration. Um, and, uh, and my fear is that Penn Plaza is going to essentially complete the circle, end up overruling Gardner Denver, Barentine, and McDonald versus West Branch. And we will have really a complete in, in my view, avoidance of the statutory schemes that Congress set up in a system that's entirely private, outside of public view. That, to me, is, is of all of the threats we've talked about, about access to the courts, this is the most serious one. And, uh, and I would be like... I would agree. Everything you say, I also would say... Uh, I'm not so sure about the the case it's, that's uh, that the, 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 the yeah I'm not so sure how that's going to come out, but I think Congress this this next current Congress is likely to uh, do something, uh, and particularly if the case comes out the way you expect, uh, they'll there will even be more apt because they'll be brought to right their attention as soon as of course we get over a few other little problems. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering whether mandatory. Uh, arbitration as, a, as opposed to, to voluntary arbitration is, is in fact an, an impediment uh, to, to successful arbitration where, where the two parties r really want to come to an agreement and they, and they, and they really feel comfortable with the, uh, with the end product of, uh, of the proceedings. So I mean, could, couldn't one argue that uh, that I in the interest of successful arbitration, that that voluntary ar arbitration should should be adhered to and 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 not uh, mandatory? Is that Go ahead. I'm not sure if you mean mediation or arbitration. Are you addressing my presentation? Okay. Um, my own belief is, and a few experiments have been done with, you know, different groups being asked, g given simulations in which they were mandated into the process versus volun volunteered in. Um, I think people forget how they got into the process. They're so, at least, I'm talking mediation now, not arbitration. They are, once they're there with the other party talking about the issues that they have found consuming and riveting and overwhelming to them, the fact that they got it in one way or another, I think, is less important. It's got to be voluntary once they're there and a, a, a good mediator would make sure it is. But I'd just like to say one thing about arbitration as well, a mandatory arbitration, very, very hot issue. The a number of acts are pending in Congress right now um, that would address 
mandatory arbitration in consumer and employment cases. And speaking from the point of view of the ABA and all the sections, everybody's trying to weigh in on these acts. There's so that the regime of mandatory arbitration may uh, fall by virtue of legislation rather than court action. Um, that's one possibility. Someone over here, is there another question? Is there no other questions? Thank you. I think we're adjourned. If I just can have a minute of your time, I just want to say a few thank yous. Thank you to all the panelists that came here today. Professor Enton, Professor Hill, and Professor Adler, thank you so much for helping us formulate this topic and working on finding panelists to come today. Thank you to IT and Nancy Pratt. I sound like I won an Oscar. Um, I was, well, I think the success of this program is the law school equivalent of, of an, an Oscar. I'm very, very happy that everybody came. I think it went off very well, and just thank you to everybody. And there's a reception upstairs in Blackacre with food and drink if you all would like to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have another one.